uh, Dwayne Hart. I uh, work at Memorial University of Newfoundland uh, with the uh, computer science department. I'm tasked with uh, handling uh, the Department of Math and Stats. Uh, believe it or not, the Department of Math and Stats are very demanding on our services than computer science. Um, they just want to run their code and just hit go. So today I'll be talking to you about Tales from the North, a system administration of a geographically dispersed network. So about five years ago, I joined a, a northern internet service provider in Yellowknife. Uh, there was about 50 sites, 25 in the Northwest Territories and 25 in Nunavut. Uh, there were segregated uh, sites and uh, it was an interesting time. The satellite head end is still located in Ottawa. Here's a, a map of what it looked like. So you can't really see it, this purple side is Nunavut, Northwest Territories. Down here, northwest of Quebec is an island called Santa Kilowack, which is part of Nunavut. Yep. How's that? Excellent. So a typical site configuration and satellite equipment, the black box for my interest, uh, local area network equipment, which consisted of a router and a switch, wireless network equipment, another black box I didn't really care about because I'm a system in by trade. I like iron. Uh, for the servers, we had two or more physical systems located there. Um, I don't know, you could probably say that they're white box general systems. So let's focus on remote sites. Originally, each site ran a full instance of FreeBSD 5.21, along with various software stacks on them, and it was bad. Uh, as equipment aged, we purchased new equipment or repurposed equipment that had failed and deployed it back in the community. We found with the newer equipment that 5.21 was, was not supporting the hardware that we purchased and we we're kind of, you know, where do we go? So the uh, software group and a couple of uh, the NOC admins got together, this is prior to me joining, and said, all right, let's make use of uh, FreeBSD jails, and uh, put our services that we offer to our clients into these jails, and then, you know, it doesn't matter what you have on the server side. And that allowed us to, you know, proceed. So, you know, the, j the jails were, there was two per community. The first was uh, mail and DNS, the second with LDAP, uh, DHCP, and the network accounting stack. So I was listening to see how much traffic the end users were using. So let's see what else. Uh, I caught, yeah, definitely a headache. And then we had to rely on our local community service uh, support provider, or CSP, to go out and be our eyes and ears in the site when we didn't have a person there. When we uh, would uh, send a tech, that tech would be you know, looking at the infrastructure that was in place and making adjustments and what have you. They were not really knowledgeable with BSD, but they could replace a hard drive and what have you if required and fix cabling. So, how do we, you know, for troubleshooting, oh, am I all over the board? So troubleshooting, uh, not all platforms uh, ran the same OS. If we encountered an issue, a software issue, how did we debug? Not all systems had the appropriate software stacks in order to do debugging. How do we, you know, move forward? Um, we started, you know, it's like, what can we do? This is where I came in and said, all right, let's try and make everything homogenized out of a heterogeneous network or distributed computing stack. So I went with the, uh, this was FreeBS server, FreeBSD server approach, uh, where each system uh, was configured with DHCPD, TFTP, NFS, and I set up the uh, DHCPD.conf for the uh, servers that were sitting on management network, and then, you know, from there, I would take that same tarball and 
do a clean install of the other system uh, once it was booted as a diskless node. You know, proper disk layout. Um, our first couple of sites we were like, well, let's just go with, you know, one slice and a tree hierarchy and what have you. But then it was like, how do we roll out a new update? Well, this, to resolve that, we went with uh, a three-slice approach. Uh, the first two would be for the OS, and the third would be for the local data. And we would move our jails into that space, and then use the boot, the boot zero config with the appropriate flags to uh, instruct the system to boot off that alternate slice. So here's a, a sample TFTP uh, configuration. Um, we found when we were doing Iowa, iOS upgrades with the Cisco gear that um, the uh, built-in TFTP stack uh, just couldn't handle. Uh, we were running into issues. So we went with the HPA, uh, TFTP HPA from ports, um, block size, and then in the rc.conf we had this enabled. We bound that system to an address and secured it through HC hosts that allow, along with our ACLs that were on the routers. So we had a kind of a two-tier security uh, mechanism. For DHCP, uh, we had this kind of setup where, you know, it's a traditional setup with regards to the next server, the file name that we wanted to boot from, and the root path. Now, I should point out that, uh, you know, changing the file name, you can implement different uh, Pixie boot uh, binaries that can come with uh, different distributions, and this root path can flow to any of your distributions. We were running 32-bit, and we were looking at, you know, what it would go down the road if we had to turn around and do 64-bit uh, platforms. So it kind of gives you a bit of flexibility there to have rolling upgrades, an A and a B side. If an A side was live, we'd update the B. If the B went, was dark, we'd up, light it up and upgrade it. And try to keep our service outage for our customers to absolute minimum. We would send out email notifications ahead of time saying that uh, there would be a service disruption. And the reason for that disruption, you know, and point form to them so that they were never left out in the dark. And then with NFS shares, you have your typical exports uh, definition, and then your corresponding rc.conf flags to bring that together. Any questions so far? I might be running too fast. I'm on the East Coast. So I had, you know, talked to you a little bit about debugging, relying on the local CSP to go to that communication shack, probably turn off the uh, PA unit that was uh, driving the signal through the dish and allowing them to work safely either outside or inside. Uh, one thing that I came up with was uh, the use of SysLinux with the memdisk option. So you could configure your already existing TFTP infrastructure to run, you know, mem tests. This was an example. One thing that it did was uh, some of these uh, systems that we purchased came with diagnostic ISOs. I'd move that to the community and adjust the script accordingly. And then if a system went down, I'd have the, uh, was it, if A went down, B was lit up with running the services, I'd have the ISO mounted such that I could boot client A if it was not a power uh, supply or motherboard issue. If it booted, I got it diskless, and then I could run the applicable tests through uh, the mem disk uh, booting that ISO. So it, that helped cut down on cost of flying a tech to that community, uh, cost of not having to ship a uh, white box replacement system. So, you know, we could say, oh, it's RAM or it's hard drive. All right, let's ship that and send it out. And then either wait for a, a time frame where we were going to have that site serviced uh, for 
you know, uh, if we had a tech visiting or some other uh, work being done. And that was, again, to ensure that our end clients had the best service that was possible. And we always stress service. We never gave nines because in the north, power is susceptible. You never, you'd have rolling power outages due to generator failures. You, or they'd have an outage, not tell us, and then we were kind of left scrambling trying to figure out how things were, why things had gone down off, off grid. Um, so then I kind of explain here. So for the SysLinux project, uh, you can un, you know, download it from kernel.org, copy these binaries to TFTP. Here's your default menu. You can adjust this. They have examples on their wiki site uh, to uh, use Clonezilla, uh, boot. Uh, was another distribution, uh, rescue CD, you know, hardware tests and stuff like that. So as long as you didn't have to, as long as you could prepare for any uh, event, you could have a proper a tool infrastructure to call upon to help diagnose that issue. This, this discless stuff? No, that was all local in that community. Yeah, everything ran off one master, and then we take the secondary server, make that a client, so boot it. Yep, that's, that's, that's how I was, oh, no, no, sorry, I'm glad you brought that forward, because I, I probably glossed over that. Um, so either it could be the master, if required, either it could be, we had one incident where we lost the hard drive subsystem on a server, and I said, this would be a great idea to you know, light it up, that server, in diskless mode, and just see if we can run a few uh, jails on it. So as the primary server that was left running with the, the two PEZs were you know, handling customer information, I was running a test on the second server saying, yes, I can launch another jail. I can do these other jobs if required. I could have that primary server that's in flight or you know live. I could have that as a, a data store, mount uh, a share off that to the client machine, and then nullfs mount into the jail or what have you to share information. So it's like it's different layers of an onion if you want to look at it that way. You could do wild and beautiful things with this. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, you know. You're sitting through this again, and uh, Chris Moore had his talk yesterday about the PC uh, thin client installations. It would, I, I would have loved to have those applications back in 2007, instead of having to figure this out myself. So, you know, uh, along with uh, configuring SysLinux on the uh, server side, um, we made a change in the uh, we created an images directory where we contained the, the ISOs that we had. Uh, the uh, change the string in dhcpd.com from uh, Pixie Linux to GP uh, Linux uh, for the uh, for the bootstrapping, and uh, that kind of leads to some of the work that I'm doing at Memorial, and I'll get into that later on in the talk. But uh, this opens up you know, booting through a web server and stuff like that. You could kind of have your distribution on a, a remote web server and access through gpixie or ipixie. And that's fairly interesting work there. And then, of course, once you change your config, do a sanity check, make sure nothing is broken, restart the service, boot the client machine, and then perform whatever tests that you wanted to do such as, you know, men test. So now that we had 50 sites, this was uh, only done in Nunavut with the hope of doing it in the Northwest Territories when the time was uh, right to start upgrading that infrastructure there. Um, 
what else? Uh, so we had our head satellite node in Ottawa. We had a Yellowknife office, so we had a presence there. We had some servers. Uh, this uh, framework uh, for the jail implementation worked so well. We wanted to start to convert our services in these two locations to run the same way. So we almost had a cookie cutter type approach for you know handling uh, software stack upgrades for the jails and what have you. And then uh, we took turns. Uh, you know, once we were we had um, made these jails of the various services, we would kind of roll them across the different servers and you know do the same technique of updating the base OS there. So we could you know run FreeBSD 6.2, I think it was 7.1 before I left. Um, I'm not sure, you know, this, this technique you know, lent itself uh, to many uh, applications. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, I never got to finish it out. Now with that, uh, you know, I talked about a tarball, you know, pushing it up, using that to do a client install. I took that same tarball framework and created a custom uh, ISO so that uh, when the technicians went to that site and we didn't have you know, our open gear consoles in those remotes, uh, they could just put that CD in, configure the servers to boot off the network card, and I could do it, uh, you know, I guess, blind, flying by the seat of my pants. I did that in a, cu in a couple of uh, Northwest Territories communities with success, but still kind of had my fingers crossed because you never know which way it was going to go. Let's see. So some interesting notes. Uh, I talked about the custom tarball. The option, if you had the multiple slices, you could have uh, you know, alternate OSs that you could uh, use. You know, if uh, the software group wanted to try out 64-bit FreeBSD, that option was available. Or if something got corrupt, we could go to that secondary image, reboot the server, repair uh, with the known good patch that we had deployed. And for deployment, we used uh, Ardist for sending the data out to the communities. I had changed that to use rsync because uh, I thought I could, uh, or S well, there was rsync, and I was using some flags such that, you know, try to change the uh, algorithm that SSH was using so it would be a bit lighter and try to not congest the network when it was going up so that the community wasn't suffering a blackout period. Um, let's see. Uh, so now creating your own custom free BSD tarball, that gave you the flexibility of, you know, taking, my work was based on uh, free BSD release. So it was 6.2 release, and then you know I used a nullifest amount of uh, user ports, put in the packages that I wanted, customized to you know for some op optimizations with you know for RC, Wireshark, and a few others, and that allowed uh, flexibility going forward. That all the sites had the same binaries, had the same software stack. If an issue was going to be seen, it was going to be across the board, or it's an edge case, and we had the method to debug and provide, you know, information back to the software group to say, hey, this is an issue, can you resolve it? No. Oh, okay, it's a, you know, a kernel or an OS related trouble, we can submit a ticket to uh, FreeBSD through their reporting mechanism, offer as much data to that group to help diagnose the issue uh, better. And then um, I know security is a kind of a, a dirty word. Uh, people were talking about two tier, uh, two t was it uh, two, level two or two types of uh, authentication. Um, upgrade your server. You know, that's the, the beauty of using OpenBSD over FreeBSD is you always had a you know, 
go forward basis, you're always going to the newest uh, binaries and packages. But sometimes we didn't have the luxury, we had to sit on a software stack. But, you know, previously with how the systems were built, we didn't have access to the same ports and stuff like that. Having the custom tarball, custom ISO, we could archive the user ports, we could go back in time and revisit, bring in uh, backported security patches. I had put in place a, a build patch server that would, you know, on a weekly basis, I'd read the uh, emails that were going out from security, pull down the appropriate uh, patches or fixes. If it was a quick fix, I did it in the field uh, during off hours. The beauty uh, with the position is uh, I lived up in the Illinois for a year, and after which I got to move back to Newfoundland and work for the, from Newfoundland for three years telecommuting. So I was three and a half hours ahead of everyone else. So when everybody in the West was asleep, I was up working and patching and building and getting uh, keeping the show moving until the Yellowknife office, or Ottawa came on, then the Yellowknife office, and you know, that responsibility was moved out. So, so future work, and this is almost coming to a conclusion, is, you know, with the knowledge and experience that I had gained from this, this position, I'm, you know, I, I took that framework and I was able to use it within the Department of Mathematics and Statistics, where I'm currently working, um, and deployed a, with knowledge, with uh, my manager, so every, everything was above board, you know, people embraced things, because we were a Linux shop in the university. We were running Gen 2 Linux, almost like Linux from scratch. And uh, for that, uh, you know, I ran FreeBSD 9.1, AMD 64-bit as my master server, had, and this was on older Dell gear, like dual core, you know, with a two disk uh, setup, one with UFS, one with ZFS. Um, my uh, NFS share was on the UFS file system. The ZFS, I used that to set up uh, iSCSI targets for some client machines, and then I also did NFS shares, and uh, one of my uh, you know, I had two compute nodes set up so that I could do some testing. I had a third that I mounted up or booted as a client, and I put two three terabyte disks in it, ran it as a ZFS mirror, and I backed up that single ZFS disk to that share. You know, kind of stupid, but it was just a point of concept type approach, and I'll be fixing that in the next month. But on that main server, I uh, set up Time Machine because I had clients within the department using the Mac OS, other than using SMB shares to access their home directory and printers, how else are we gonna back up their file systems uh, appropriately so that if an installation went wrong, we had a way to back that out for them. So that's uh, kinda almost finished beta and going into production. Um, let's see, iSCSI uh, targets. That gives it a lot of flexibility. Um, we were finding on one of our compute nodes in math that uh, the, the disk I.O. was just being congested. Uh, the computations, uh, the binaries were just causing a, a massive uh, load increase of over 10, and the machine was just stagnant. When I brought in the iSCSI target, uh, the uh, disk I.O. was o pushed over to the network stack, and that it was amazing the speed increase uh, for the researchers running their code. So they were happy. And we didn't have to go out and repur you know, purchase new hardware for a dedicated file system and all that for them. And then I used ZFS uh, snapshots to, you know, at least uh, twice a week to give them a point in time reference to go back to in the case that anything went missing. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. At the time, it was just installed P because PC B BSD install just didn't exist. And uh, uh, 
No, that's what I was going to go to. On the 9.1 system I have in Mac, I used uh, PCB as the install. And I liked it. I, when I sat in the lecture yesterday from Chris Moore, I was like, oh, this is great. Now I've seen an example. I can take that, embrace it, and extend kind of this framework that I, I developed back in the day. Right? It's really good for the thin clients. It's just phenomenal. And one, one thing that, with regards to, you know, if I could go back to the Ottawa head end that I talked about having a, you know, the servers uh, there and then doing a rolling update and you have your A and your B. We did make use of Gmirror. We had RAID mirroring. We had backups. We had, uh, what was it, a 12-hour turnaround and backup. So we had a, uh, a primary and a secondary backup server and we were backing up data. The, the, and this was when FreeNAS started, oops, FreeNAS started uh, uh, coming out, and I really liked the iSCSI approach. So the goal, my vision, was to create, to take one of the primary backup servers, turn that into almost like a SAN appliance, take all the cluster or the servers in front, make them thin clients, and then they just uh, mount up that iSCSI target, launch the jails, and you know, people just see that. You know the services are operational. Next. Uh, about seven to eight hundred milliseconds. Yeah. That's that's beyond my scope. Uh, but I'll tell you that they did use ways, Cisco Way devices to help acceleration and stuff like that. That's why I kind of said the satellite and the wireless gear, that's all black box to me. Yeah. The hardware, the server side, that's where I was interested in. With that, you know, you could take the, uh, the tarball, create a custom CD, and you almost had a, like a Swiss Army knife of going out in the field to deploy your free BSD, uh, update, go back to a known instance. You could use uh, custom M trees to do you know, this for finding out about audit and security. Uh, you know, different security applications you could use to audit your systems. And then, you know, also I did enable uh, reports to be sent back to uh, the NetOps group and we'd look at the emails, make sure the systems were still functioning. We had Nagios, we had 52 instances of Nagios with NRPE shipping the data back to Ottawa and, and Yellowknife. So we also had kind of the heartbeat going to s make sure that the, the sites were up, plus that we're monitoring the monitor and, you know, tried to make it almost a lights out uh, network. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm just kind of more curious about the hardware side. Does the lithography piece in that any consideration when you're selecting the servers and stuff like that? Uh, the servers were just uh, generic 1U boxes. Um, they were running uh, Pentium 4 at uh, about 1.2 gigahertz and, uh, you know, uh, two gig uh, memory footprint. Uh, that was a Dell 750. Um, I did get my hands on a Dell R300 back in the day, so we were beefing up the uh, infrastructure as the site visits were happening. You know, we were, were trying to rem remove the onus on uh, talking with the CSP with regards to troubleshooting and, and installation of equipment because in the north, believe it or not, uh, they're on their own timeline. You know, it's hunting season, it's this, that, and then you, you try to convey. When you call the CSP, you chat with them very nicely. You use nice language so that, you know, you try to convey the, the seriousness of the issue that they should you know, go out to the communication shack for us and, you know, tweak a, a button or jiggle a cable or snow, uh, remove a bit of snow or, you know, put a bit of padding into the vents so that the wind, the Arctic uh, air doesn't uh, cool down the shacks. Believe it or not, at some sites we did have heating issue in the dead of winter. So minus 40 below, our comm shacks are running too hot. And it was where they were co-located. I can't get into that, unfortunately, but we had to ask them to, to open up the door, 
and let a bit of the chill come in. Now, of course, with that, as you know, drastic changes in temperature, moisture occurs, and I had one gentleman say, oh, the site was down, I took everything home, used a hair dryer, <laughs> I'm like, no. So I made notes, next guy came on shift, and I said, you might want to phone this community because this is what this is after happening. And he's like, oh, damn. So, and, you know, so you work with what you get. Yes, sir? Sorry? Uh, in the north? I was 50. Well, 52 if you count, uh, count uh, Yellowknife in Ottawa. So currently now back at Memorial, I have too many machines. Uh, you Yep. Yeah, we were using open gear for console access and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, we were uh, replacing uh, our power distribution units with, I forget the brand name, so that we could remotely uh, SSH in and trip them if required. That helped a couple of times uh, over satellite. Is it, uh, so I don't know. Does anybody have any ZFS tales, like weirdest installs or anything like that? Or was the one that I talked about the weirdest one so far? Yep. What other problems? Shipping? Yeah. That's a big problem. Yeah. Um, the shipping problems, jeez, uh, uh, flights uh, being canceled due to uh, the Arctic Arctic winter setting in. Uh, you you guys have probably watched uh, that uh, Discovery Channel ice pilots at the NWT. Uh, it's pretty nasty stuff that they get to fly in. So we'd have delays in the shipping out equipment and personnel, um, getting gaining access to our remote co-locations was an issue. Uh, there was a, uh, um, an outstanding um, disagreement between two companies <laughs> and uh, we had to s have paperwork signed and presented to them and say we will be coming onto the site to see our equipment on this date. And unfortunately in an emergency situation where community was offline we needed the, our local uh, community service uh, support provider in there as soon as possible. We had to, you know, work with that person to, you know, expedite that issue, tracking down someone in that community working for that company to let us in. So it was always a logistical nightmare. Shipping equipment in reliably, safely is another thing. So if you can embed your hardware <laughs> as much as possible, because you know, put fragile on it, <laughs> drop it on the on the runway, a little bit extra for it before it gets on the plane. I'm not really gentle. Actually, actually, there was a story where our tech was in a community, and I'm not sure of the distance, and he took a, sk a skidoo with, with the local CSP of the community he was in to visit another one because they needed someone ASAP. So, you know, it's not like driving down the highway, going to the next site. You know, getting at the door. Oh, everything's you know, lovely, cozy. This is pretty harsh conditions. And you know, thankfully, I, the job that I had, I got to sit on the front porch and watch the young guys come in and you know, pat them on the back and say, "Atta boy, come on in for a beer. Everything's good." Um, any other questions regarding logistics up north? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, temperature sensors and stuff like that. Yeah, we had uh, was it uh, minus forty five? You know, with the Chinooks coming in, um, we had in the summertime where it'd be ten degrees. Uh, a com shack wouldn't have been, you know, I guess summerized, dewinterized, if you would, and the temperatures were soaring over thirty degrees. The, the yeah, Celsius. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's damn hot. Yeah. As long as they were running, they were fine. But if they had to start from a cold stop, that's where you ran into trouble. Uh, yeah, there's some stories that can be said on that, but unfortunately, it's not my time. <laughs> oh, you're here. Oh. oh, my gosh. I said it was going to be early. Chris Moore got to go out to his lecture early. Uh, what? Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. Damn. All right, I guess I'm not coming back next year. Um, yeah, you know, uh, we had a good core. Um, we had a small group. There was four, five, there was five people working in the knock in Yellowknife at the time. Um, four of them uh, were network and satellite uh, gurus. And then there was little old me, the Unix admin, you know, learning the... the the, uh, that framework and you know brought forth this uh, framework to them. I learned you know how to update uh, the Cisco iOS equipment, uh, configure ports, ACL, you know what to check for. And then working with the software group uh, with the jails, um, rolling out new, new services and stuff like that. Uh, one thing I, I really glossed over in Ottawa is uh, we had the web uh, ser service instances located there for our clients so that they could have access to the fat pipes south. At the time, we didn't have gigabit to Yellowknife. We had, I think it's 100 meg connection, copper. And, you know, it was poor connection up there. Uh, so our clients got to benefit from having their uh, sites hosted south, right? And uh, with that, uh, you know, that was the, one of the talks uh, yesterday. They were talking about, uh, you know, using NullFS to try and minimize the footprint of a jail and then creating uh, other jails or clones off that jail and then having these thinner provisioned instances out there. We were doing that. Uh, this was before... Um, Warden came on field, so we had to customize our start and stop scripts for uh, jail administration. That was a bit of a kerfuffle. Um, and then when it came to patch time, uh, we, you know, we had a a framework in which we could operate safely, and such that we didn't, you know, uh, interrupt our uh, end users' experiences with the system because. Uh, it, I guess back at that time it was like, you know, the internet, you really need it. People really relied on it in order for content being delivered to them through uh, on sites, purchasing, selling their unique crafts and what have you. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Sorry. No, no. We had a, we're a small shop, and everybody kind of learnt and grew together. I never had to deal with that. Uh, you know, this was a free BSD site uh, ahead of time. You know, I had to come up to speed uh, where I was a Linux guy previously. I had experience with HPOX, IBM gear, and stuff like that. Um, you know, talk, getting to know the lingo and definitions. The network guys had their definition of terms. Satellite had theirs. I had my own. Plus, I had an accent. Talk, you know, it was... <laughs> Slow down, take the easy, you know, enunciate. I might mumble sometimes, but it's a form of communication. Um, as I was saying earlier, I'm, I'm usually behind, in the back room making sure everything just works. If you see me out front, it's bad. 
right? You, I'm kept in the back. So this is the infrastructure that I have at the University of Syracuse. Beautiful. Just take your time. I grew up with, you know, with CRT and thin clients on the deck. It was just like, yeah, okay. I'll have a coffee. You know, the things got done. It's just unfortunately we had uh, lag, and then we had uh, pack a lot due to the older infrastructure that got replaced. Now with the the newer equipment that's been deployed, oh, it's you know the the hardest part is going through the open gears. Uh, uh, management module. That's kind of a bit of a thick uh, kludge there. Up north? I can't tell you. Eric, would you be able to spot me on that? We had a taxi driver in one community use the modem and drive around and access the internet, you know, while it was, on, you know, between jobs and what ha uh, and f uh, job fairs or what have you. And it was just uh, brilliant to see that, you know, here he is driving in the community, still has internet access, doing his thing, right? It's like crazy. So. Sorry. Oh, it was wireless, Motorola. Yep. What range? A couple of feet. Uh, what was about five, 900 yards out. So close. And in some instances, we had um, a wireless connection between two sites using Dragon Wave uh, technology. So. How close the signal was, the quality of the signal, and what have you. And then, you know, if depending on uh, what the environment was like, if it was raining or snow, that congestion, that build up of snow on the dish and stuff like that. And it's gotten better as the different uh, satellite components change with uh, different carriers and what have you. Yes, sir. Um, for offsite in the Ottawa head end, we had one server in the building and then in the Ray Dome, which was about a three minute walk, or I shouldn't say a three minute walk, yeah, about a three minute walk, physically separated. So we, no, no backup, no backup. And that, and the, and the clients were notified that, you know, if there's an outage, your email is gone. They used, uh. They didn't have IMAP, they had POP, so everything was local to their systems. We tried to keep uh, all their data off our systems. But if they paid a plan, then you know, we, I implemented an R-Sync algorithm to migrate jails back and forth and keep them in sync as much as possible so that you know, you're out 15 minutes at the, at the, at the latest. So, you, know, you can only do so much. And then the sites were using uh, UFS file systems, maybe a ZFS implementation with snapshotting and then sending and receiving would have been great, but you know, that was really, it, well, it started, it started to exist in seven, and, uh, but it was still buggy and not all, the feature set wasn't there, you know, unfortunately. You know. And then, I took a uh, stock FreeBSD release ISO, uh, extracted it on the local file system, uh, kind of 
did a quasi jail setup and used, uh, you know, mounted up the proc and the dev file systems, uh, and then uh, chain rooted into them, and then applied, uh, you know, updates to update the binaries of the system, install packages that I wanted. And once that was done, I went in and hacked out components that I didn't want. I created new uh, M tree files with uh, CK sums. Was, there was a, a URL for monkey brains that I came across. So you're kind of like, this is kind of the framework that you wanted to use. But he was like, yeah, I don't know how to put the file just the right way. So I, I had the script. But unfortunately, when I left the company, I, le I left that where it was. So I had to, I had to rebuild it if anybody's interested in that. And it wouldn't take too long because I have the, fr the framework already. So this is, you could base it on a, a FreeBSD release. You could base it on a test or the latest if you want. As long as you got that ISO, you can make it what you want. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. That's a wrap. Thank you very much.